For joining us today, I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation, and I publish a blog called The Washington Note, uh, which is airing uh, today's program live. I'm also very pleased to have book uh, notes of C-SPAN uh, TV with us as well, and so I want to greet uh, those viewers that are uh, getting the opportunity to spend some time with Juan Cole on his new book, Engaging the Muslim World, uh, on C-SPAN, on the blog, on YouTube, wherever you may see it. Juan Cole is simply one of the uh, most important and coolest commentators on the Muslim world, Arabic world, Iran, uh, Israel-Palestine issues, Syria that we have in this country. And I've often called him a living national treasure uh, who happens to be uh, 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 an academic at the University of Michigan, a historian, an outstanding uh, commentator, and really an interpreter of, of the history, the politics, and culture of a region that I think represents the defining challenge for the United States in this era. Um, Juan, of course, writes the, the very well-known blog called Informed Comment at JuanCole.com, and he and I got to know each other somewhat electronically years ago uh, when we were both finding our way forward uh, in the nexus between what we would consider to be smart public policy commentary, thinking out loud, if you will, interacting with people that were coming up uh, and commenting, those you agree with us and those who would scream at us. Uh, and, and we have sort of, a, I would tell people, sort of a support group sometimes where we huddle together, shivering, wondering how we're uh, dealing with our audiences. Juan is much more of a pro than I am, but uh, he's been a great mentor and friend to me uh, for, for, for several years now. I think the first time we met was a major conference in September of 2005 uh, that we did on uh, trying to rebrand uh, how we approach and think about terrorism, for instance, at that point. Uh, but this new book, uh, Engaging the Muslim World, I've already, I'm halfway through it, uh, and I'm hoping that he will touch on uh, Iran, uh, the Wahhabist myth, et cetera. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, and I am so pleased that he's here, here with us today. And I could talk on and on, and I'll have my own opportunity, but I want to promote uh, and have a discussion with all of you. So without further ado, uh, please welcome my good friend, Juan Cole. Well, uh, uh, thanks so much uh, to uh, Steve Clemens for that very warm uh, introduction and uh, to the Na uh, New America Foundation for hosting this event. Um, so uh, this book uh, that I, I just brought out uh, called Engaging the Muslim World uh, is a call for a different kind of relationship of the United States with uh, the Muslim majority states. Uh, than we have been having in recent years. Uh, the United States, from the point of view of the Muslim world, uh, has been uh, acting aggressively in the region. Uh, their perception is that we invaded two countries and occupied them, uh, that we did a lot of damage in the course of that, which the American press and public doesn't focus so much on the damage done. Uh, and that U.S. policy seems to be destabilizing uh, other neighboring places like Pakistan. This is, I'm saying, from the point of view of the Muslim world, uh, U.S. policy uh, is, um, is not a force for, for stability uh, as it's been practiced in recent years. Uh, the U.S. helped to overturn the results of the uh, 2006 elections for the Palestine Authority. Uh, and introduced um, perhaps unsurmountable obstacles to the um, pursuit of a, of a peace process in uh, Israel-Palestine, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. In fact, uh, the, the new complaints about U.S. policy in the region um, uh, really go far beyond the old complaints, which mainly were, A, that the U.S. tended to support authoritarian governments in the region, uh, and B, uh, that it was not even-handed on the uh, Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, the, the, the laundry list of, of complaints has, has grown enormously. I think some people would be happy enough if we just go back to our, our, our previous foibles. Um, so the book is, is a call for doing it differently. Uh, and one of, the, um, one of the points I'm trying to make here is that a lot of U.S. policy seems to me to be, be made on poor information, poor perception, poor judgment uh, about this world. Um, uh, there, if, you, if you take seriously, uh, as, as I do, the speeches of senators and congressmen 
of presidential candidates. Uh, here's the kind of thing that we hear. That Wah the Wahhabi branch of Islam, the Wahhabi branch of Islam in, in Saudi Arabia is mainly a Saudi phenomenon. Qatar is also uh, a Wahhabi uh, state, um, and there are Wahhabis in Sharjah. Uh, but uh, those are small places, and th there, there aren't actually what you could properly call Wahhabis outside those three. That is to say, the term is sometimes used pejoratively uh, or as shorthand for um, fundamentalist Muslims or hardline uh, Muslims, but um, it is a kind of national branch of Islam in Saudi Arabia. Not all Saudis adhere to it, but um, it is alleged by many uh, politicians and pundits in the United States that there's a, a connection between the Wahhabi branch of Islam and the spread of terrorism. And um, while I would agree that the Wahhabi tradition is from the point of view of the Western Enlightenment, narrow-minded uh, and often intolerant uh, and uh, puritanical and, and so on and so forth. It is, it's a, uh, it is an authoritarian tradition. I can't find a connection, a special connection, uh, to terrorism. Um, uh, most terrorism that's been committed, if you define it as non-state actors, uh, committing violence against civilians for the achievement of political goals. Most terrorism coming out of the Muslim world or the Middle East has been Sunni or Shiite. Uh, Egypt has generated a lot. You have the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, you have uh, al gamal Islamia, uh, you have the uh, Salafi movement in Algeria. Algeria doesn't get much play over here, but you know they have fought more or less a civil war in the past 15 years uh, over this issue of secular versus fundamentalist. And the armed Islamic group that came out of that maelstrom uh, was a fundamentalist group. So, uh, you know, th there, were Wahhabi, there were Wahhabi Saudis involved in Al-Qaeda, but then I don't think they were by any means disproportionate or a majority. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, uh, Osama bin Laden is a very prominent figure, but you can't read everything off of one guy. And moreover, the bin Ladens are not even from Saudi Arabia originally. Uh, uh, Osama's father is from the Hadramaut, from southern Yemen. And uh, I'm not even sure that uh, they are Wahhabis. Uh, and so it seems to me that there's a lot of myth-making about this issue. And, and you, you can say that, well, Wahhabism as a tradition promotes gender segregation, and even some would say gender apartheid, uh, that, uh, that it doesn't make a place for its minorities, uh, and so forth. And th those would be legitimate criticisms, and we could talk about how those uh, issues might be addressed in diplomacy uh, and so forth including public diplomacy, but, uh, but, but the thesis is not that, 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 the, that the Wahhabi tradition is narrow-minded or, or that it uh, promotes uh, gender uh, segregation. The, the, the thesis is that it's connected to terrorism in some essential way, and that I can't find any evidence for. And in fact, I can't even find any evidence for the idea that Wahhabism is in some essential way uh, rigid or inflexible about some of these other issues, because for instance, the Wahhabis of Qatar don't, don't practice it the way the Saudis do. So in Saudi Arabia, uh, public worship by other religions is not, not allowed. You can't have a church, an uh, open public church in Saudi Arabia. But Qatar just licensed a church uh, and, so, and, and plans to license more. So they're both Wahhabi states. If, if, if one is, why, why should we say that Saudi policy is the real Wahhabism? Uh, and I have a former student in, in uh, Qatar who, uh, who, who explained this to me. He said, there's Wahhabism of the desert and there's Wahhabism of the sea. Uh, so uh, uh, th th there's a lot of myth-making and essentialism, sort of assuming that things are rigid or inflexible or the same everywhere. And we saw this in the, in the presidential campaign, and I quoted in the book, that um, um, presidential candidate on the Republican side, Mitt Romney, uh, at one point castigated his Democratic opponents. 
uh, and said, you know, they're trying to say this is all about one man, bin Laden, that, that this issue of terrorism is al-Qaeda. He said it's not that. It's about Sunni and Shia. It's about Hezbollah and the Muslim Brotherhood. It's about the caliphate. And he clearly was attempting to construct the Muslim world as a monolithic whole and moreover as a threat to the United States, as, as a monolithic threat. I think um, there are some politicians, and, and on, in both parties actually, who deeply regret the passing of communism because it was such a good gig uh, in the United States. You know, Dick Nixon and, and others uh, made their careers that way. So if only, you know, we could get a green menace, uh, an Islamic menace uh, going, uh, uh, maybe it would replace uh, the Marxist menace. And I, I regret to report to them that it won't work. Um, because first of all, Mr. Romney, Shiites are not in favor of a caliphate. And in fact, how they got to be Shiites was that they rejected the idea of a caliphate. So um, the idea that you can amalgamate all these things. And uh, in Lebanon, uh, in, in recent years, you've had a kind of criminal gang with uh, terrorist connections operating in the Nahr al-Barad uh, uh, refugee camp, uh, which is called in Lebanon at least al-Qaeda. Uh, and nobody was more forceful in their demand that the government go in and take care of that group than Hezbollah. So Hezbollah and al-Qaeda don't get along, uh, not on the same page. Uh, and in fact, it's now forgotten, but uh, al-Qaeda, when it was operating in, in Afghanistan in the 1990s, was responsible for massacres of Shiites uh, and, and as in, in alliance with the Taliban. Hazaras were killed uh, in, in large numbers who are, who are Afghan Shiites. So it's not a monolith. Uh, and. And on the one hand, they talk like that to the American public as, as, as if we're children and it's easy for them to construct myths for us. On the other hand, what was their actual policy at that time was to try to get an alliance of Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan and tacitly Israel going against Iran and Hezbollah. So in their actual policy, they recognized that it's not all the same thing and in fact tried to play on those divisions. But when they came out and campaigned for president and spoke to us, then they said, well, it's all the same thing. So it's, it's a very Wizard of Oz-like situation where we're being told one thing on television when they give speeches, and their actual policies are something quite, quite different. And, and neither of them salubrious. Neither the idea that Islam is a monolith, kind of un unrelenting hostility coming from all sections of it towards the United States is uh, solitary, nor the actual policy of trying to divide the Muslim world against itself uh, in order to divide and rule, uh, and, and which anyway didn't work because um, just on the face of it, an alliance of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel <laughs> against Iran uh, is, is not, not very likely. And so as the Bush administration had been pushing for that, uh, policy. Uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia was inviting Ahmadinejad to, to Riyadh and keeping the lines open uh, and doing diplomacy, bringing both Hamas and uh, the PLO to Mecca to try to uh, negotiate between them, even with the knowledge that Hamas uh, had links to Iran. So the, uh, the, the Muslims' powers, the Muslim powers in the region wouldn't play that game that the Bush administration was hoping that they would. With regard to the new Obama administration, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the book, at least the themes in the book, will uh, come to their attention. Uh, I, I would say that, um, and Steve and I were talking about this earlier, that so far what's being offered by the Obama administration to the Muslim world in the way of change is cosmetic uh, or it is rhetorical. And, and if you look at the opinion polling, uh, it's simply not true. You know, the Pew Charitable Trust and, and uh, Gallup and others have done a lot of polling with, mu with Muslim publics. We don't have to guess, you know. I wonder what people in Egypt think about X. There's actually very good polling on it. 
uh, and um, it's it's fairly consistent in, in its in its results. So uh, when you ask them about the United States, they don't say they hate our way of life. Um, they deny that. Um, even even Bin Laden in one of his tapes denied that he hated the Western way of life. He said, "If I had hated the Western way of life, I would have hit Sweden." Um, uh, but when you ask the Muslim world what, what do you, you know, about their problems with the United States, they don't, they don't say, well, we don't like democracy, we don't like um, uh, this, that, or the other thing. They, they say we don't like American policy. And the specific policies they don't like are Israel-Palestine uh, and uh, the Iraq and, uh, to some extent, the Afghanistan war. Although that doesn't seem to be as objectionable or didn't seem when the polling was done uh, as Iraq and, and the Palestine issue. And so the likelihood is that the Obama administration's new policy towards Iraq, which does look forward to a, um, a timetable for troop withdrawal, uh, and I believe that Obama is serious about this, and I believe that the Iraqi government is serious about the timetable. I know there are a lot of doubts in people's minds about whether the withdrawal will, will, will really happen, but I, I believe both are committed to it. It won't be a total withdrawal, the Iraqi government and the Iraqi military still lacks an air force. It still lacks certain logistical capabilities. So, uh, and it, it'll, it'll take years to build uh, an air force. So the United States Air Force is likely to be giving close air support to the Iraqi military and close engagements uh, for some time. But um, the time when you had very large numbers, tens of thousands of U.S. Uh, and, um, uh, and British troops patrolling Iraqi cities uh, and um, on the ground, I think, is passing. So I, 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 I think that withdrawal from, the, from Iraq will play well in the Muslim world and will in itself afford new opportunities uh, for U.S. Uh, to repair its relationships uh, with uh, those countries uh, and to go forward. Uh, but um, something needs to be done about Palestine. And on that issue, so far, uh, we haven't seen much, much substance. Uh, moreover, one of the burning issues in the Middle East is U.S. relationship to Iran. And uh, President Obama, on the occasion of the Persian New Year, Nowruz, recently addressed uh, uh, Iran. And unlike his predecessor, actually addressed both the government and the people uh, of Iran, did not try to pretend uh, that there were, there were two separate things, um, and said conciliatory things. The, um, uh, the response from uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei uh, was um, more or less, I'm from Missouri. Show me. Uh, let's see how your behavior changes towards us before we can uh, make a judgment here. It was not a rebuff, and the headlines in the New York Times, the Washington Post about Khamenei's speech all said you know, things like uh, Supreme Leader of Iran rebuffs Obama. It's not true. Uh, he, he said, uh, we, we have no prior experience of Mr. Obama, so we have no basis for making a judgment yet about him uh, if American behavior changes, our behavior will change. Does that sound like a rebuff to you? Uh, it is cautious. But then he also did r read the United States a long list of grievances uh, that the Iranians have with the U.S. over the years, overthrowing their government in 1953, putting boycotts on them, trying economically to strangle them, uh, encouraging internal dissent and terrorism against them, uh, um, shooting down their airliner in 1988 and um, uh, supporting Saddam Hussein against them during the Iran-Iraq War, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, that list was not read simply to vent. It, it was Khamenei's uh, way of making the point that uh, if you want a new relationship with Iran, there, has to be, there have to be practical steps taken. Um, and, of course, um, one of the complaints that he made was that the U.S. accuses Iran of trying to 
get an atomic bomb of, of, of wanting a nuclear weapon, uh, which Khamenei steadfastly has denied, and he says it's illegal in Islamic law to have atomic weapons, uh, and so forth. So um, on that issue and on the Israel-Palestine issue, obviously people are waiting to see practical steps. The situation in Palestine has deteriorated even since Obama has been in office, which isn't very long. People tend to forget this, uh, that it hasn't been very long as I speak. But um, a recent uh, a Lancet uh, report came out uh, suggesting that the Israeli blockade of Gaza, uh, which is a blockade of the civilian population, half of whom are children, uh, doesn't let enough food in. And that uh, there's actual malnourishment among Gazan children. Uh, there is even evidence of stunting. Uh, some 10 percent of the children are stunted, and in some parts of northern Gaza, it's 30 percent. This is a humanitarian disaster, and it is the result of deliberate policy. It is a war crime. You, you, you may not, in international law, collectively punish a population by half-starving its children to get a political result. Uh, and, of course, the, it, it's been revealed that the Israelis have plans for 75,000 new housing units in the West Bank. Uh, and, and then the American side says, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton says that we're going to restart the peace process. <laughs> I, I don't understand. How would you have a peace process when there's ongoing uh, land theft uh, by one side of the other? Uh, and uh, I think, you know, even George W. Bush late in his term said the West Bank looks like Swiss cheese. It's not a basis for a state. Uh, and I admit that this is a very tough nut to crack, as, is the, as are the issues that the United States has with Iran. But I think they're actually all connected, because if you really could make progress towards uh, um, peace in the Levant, uh, a lot of the problems that the United States has with Iran would go away. I mean, Gaza is not going to be interested in Iranian support if, uh, if it's not under that kind of blockade. Um, how to get forward on that Israel-Palestine issue is a real question. Now you have a, a very right-wing government forming in Israel which has typically rejected the whole idea of giving back uh, the West Bank uh, and was opposed to the troop withdrawal from Gaza. Uh, and so Obama is not going to have much to work with. Uh, and it seems to me that, that that issue will continue to fester. It will continue uh, to cause um, terrorism. And I believe that if you have a long-term apartheid uh, regime in the West Bank and uh, the continued blockade of Gaza by the Israelis, that ultimately uh, the international community will begin imposing sanctions on, on Israel. And I don't believe that Israel uh, will be able to withsta withstand those sanctions. That is to say, its economy is actually pretty dependent on its relationships, uh, economic, technological, and diplomatic, uh, with, with Europe. Uh, so I think, personally, that the Israeli policy is, is digging uh, its, its own grave. And um, I think, very increasingly, the likelihood is that you will have uh, a one-state solution, ultimately. It, you know, the, the, what's not recognized in the United States, typically, is that the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza are stateless. And it's not acceptable for them to remain stateless. Uh, the minimum uh, necessity for a dignified life in the contemporary world is citizenship in a state. Without citizenship, with, without a state, an individual has no real rights. And you can see this because Palestinian property is being taken at will every day. Uh, and how do you even travel? You have to depend on the goodwill of countries to recognize your laissez-passer. Uh, so it's not acceptable that three and a half million people in the West Bank and Gaza should be without citizenship, nor that the ones, the refugees in, in Lebanon and elsewhere should remain that way. And you know it's ironic because in 1938-39, when Hitler took the Sudetenland, he stripped the Jews uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, in the part of Czechoslovakia that he took, f 
from citizenship, and they became stateless. And at the same time, in 1939, the British government issued the White Paper in which it called for uh, restrictions on Jewish immigration to Palestine. And there was an uproar that you have now 100,000 newly stateless Jews, and the British are not letting them go the one place where they could get, get papers. Uh, so statelessness was a human rights issue in 1938-39. Uh, statelessness should be a human rights issue today. So um, I admit that the new administration has a set of tall orders before it uh, on relationships with Iran, uh, with the uh, Israel-Palestine issue, with uh, relation, continued relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, the Pakistan and Afghanistan issue, which I haven't talked about. But um, I also believe that um, there are real opportunities here and that our relationship, as, as, as uh, Stephen Clemens rightly said, uh, with this part of the world may be the most crucial one for the 21st century. And so it's, it's absolutely crucial we get it right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Juan. Uh, last night, I had the opportunity to be at a dinner with Madeleine Albright, and it was on the occasion of the Aspen Middle East Strategy Group dinner. We had visiting uh, members of the Knesset, of, of uh, Palestinian uh, representatives and others that were there. And she made a comment last night. She said one of the biggest stumbling blocks she saw to informed American engagement in the region was our profound ignorance about the Muslim world, about Islam, about the Middle East. And she said, we need a, a, a sort of Islam 101. Uh, and I said, I know the guy who's got the book uh, to, to do this. But she made that comment, and I thought it was quite, quite honest uh, of her to do that. But in the process, you know, w when we went through our discussion yesterday evening, there was one gentleman, I don't want to name, who, who said during the Gaza incursion, when Israel was there, this individual, let's just say he's on the Palestinian side, uh, unusually had a direct line to Ehud Barak, the defense minister of Israel, and said, you know, we know where Hamas's leadership is hiding. And allegedly they were hiding in a hospital. Uh, Hanie and some others were hiding in the children's wing, and another faction leadership was hiding in the uh, uh, critical care wing of this hospital. And Barack had already said, we know that, but we're not going to go further. We're trying to send a message. And it was very f interesting to see this, because the individual, of course, talking to Barack was hoping that they would take out that uh, uh, Hamas leadership. And of course, Israel said it was trying to take out the Hamas leadership. But nonetheless, if this story is true, uh, and it was just told to me at a fancy dinner, uh, it raises the question of, of the divide and conquer sort of approach that many are taking to the region, the divisions within Islam that you said are not monolithic. How manipulatable are these? And do they provide a, a permanent barrier to progress with the region? Well, I, I, it's certainly the case that the divisions within the Palestinians have been connived at by the United States and Israel. Um, um, it's, Richard Sale has, has demonstrated that uh, uh, Israel gave support to Hamas in the late 80s, uh, hoping that a, a religious group would be an offset to the uh, secular nationalism. And at the time, you know, the PLO was considered kind of a Soviet asset, and uh, so a religious group would be anti-communist and uh, might be uh, more, more uh, um, uh, malleable, and, uh, and anyway, it it's good to have uh, the Palestinians divided. Uh, and, uh, and Israeli officials have uh, admitted in the press that uh, this policy was a mistake. Uh, and in, in the, the run-up to the January 2006 elections, my understanding is, and this is based on leaks in the press, that the Israelis uh, actually didn't want Hamas to be allowed to run, uh, and that George W. Bush, uh, or whoever was in charge of his policy, insisted that, uh, that Hamas be allowed to run, because otherwise the elections wouldn't look like they were on the up and up. Uh, he wanted the, at least the appearance of free and fair elections. And, uh, and ironically, you know, the elections were fairly free and fair, and, and Hamas unexpectedly won. And this was not uh, the outcome that they were going for. They wanted the appearance of free and fair elections, but they wanted Fatah to win and then to, to pursue the peace process. And uh, when Hamas won, they really had no choice but to, uh, given their policies, but to back off and say, well, we can't deal with the new government. And, 
Ever after they tried to destabilize it, they worked against behind the scenes against the Palestinian National Unity Government, and ultimately they fomented a more or less a coup against Hamas in the West Bank uh, by the Fatah faction. Uh, and so now you've got this impossible situation where Hamas is in control of Gaza. Uh, it's not acceptable to the Israelis, and they're therefore punishing the whole Gazan people. Uh, and uh, Fatah is in, in, in control of the West Bank, but facing continued massive influx of Israeli settlers uh, into its uh, um, putative uh, domain. Uh, so I, I don't see, I mean, yes, you can divide and rule, but I don't see that you necessarily get a, a, a good outcome because now those in the U.S. government who would like to have a Palestinian interlocutor couldn't find somebody who can speak for the whole Palestinian people. And Mahmoud Abbas, uh, uh, the president of the Palestine Authority, who's from the Fatah faction, has no real credibility left. Uh, and indeed, it's been demonstrated in opinion polling that uh, the, the Gaza war increased uh, the standing of Hamas in the West Bank. Uh, so they succeeded in dividing. They haven't succeeded in ruling. And they haven't succeeded in getting any real progress on resolving this festering issue, which, you know, people keep asking, well, why is it so important? Well, just take yourself back to the mid-19th century in the United States. Why was the Alamo so important to Americans of the time? Why would people get all excited in Maine about Sam Houston and his fellows there being besieged? You know, th there, are, there are symbolic military and, and, and uh, political events that people identify with and which, which do, do excite popular emotion. And for the Muslim world, th the situation of the Palestinians being under siege in that way is like the Alamo was for the United States uh, in, in the mid-19th century. And uh, I think it is, uh, whether it's, it's rational or whether, whether it makes sense, it, it is a, a, an extremely important issue. And it, it, it helps in the recruitment of, of people to anti-American uh, sentiment and even uh, uh, to terrorism. Uh, and so it's very unwise to let it fester this way. Can you open the floor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for doing this. Thank you, Professor Cole. My name is Tom Getman, and uh, for years I worked in the humanitarian community uh, for some of those years in the Middle East. And I wonder if you know, in terms of opportunities that are out there, uh, about the Abraham Conference that meets every year in Urfa, which is the ancient city of Haran, the interim home for Father Abraham. Uh, and these 200 NGOs from Islamic countries are very interested in building bridges to the West and invited some of us from the West to come and speak to talk about humanitarian partnership. We all know how successful Hamas and Hezbollah have been in doing humanitarian work, maybe partly for political reasons. These people are doing it strictly out of humanitarian hearts. And we who have worked there have found Muslims to be incredibly tuned in to the needs, particularly of women and children, in difficult situations. I wonder if you would comment about your perception on that, and if this isn't an opportunity for those of us in the West to build bridges. Yeah, it's it's an excellent question, uh, uh, Tom. And um, uh, the opinion polling is very clear on this. For instance, they asked the Pakistani public, you know, what would make for better relations with the United States. Uh, and this was a poll done last summer. Uh, the response was, we want more development aid. Uh, we want more health care aid. Um, and uh, I think it's not widely known. There are a lot of these Muslim-majority countries have high rates of things like malaria and so forth, which are eradicable, I mean, with, with the, the right investments and, and, and wouldn't be so expensive. And the U.S. actually, to be fair, has uh, uh, from time to time uh, been involved in, in projects like that in, in, in Pakistan. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard to keep it going consistently across administrations and across changes in Pakistani regime and so forth. Uh, and they complained, the, the Pakistani public complained in this poll uh, that the U.S. had given Pakistan, well, they didn't say it in this, these terms, but, you know, the U.S. had given Pakistan $10 billion after September 11th altogether, mainly in the form of military aid. And they didn't want the military aid because, of course, it strengthens the army and uh, the, the, the more praetorian uh, uh, sections of society. 
so uh, another piece of evidence on all this is the um, that uh, in 2000, the favorability rating of the United States and Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country, was 75 percent. Three quarters of Indonesians thought well or very well of the United States in 2000. Uh, by 2004, it had fallen to 14 percent, according to the Pew Char Charitable Trust poll. Uh, and um, uh, however, uh, after the tsunami and, and, and the way that the U.S. helped uh, with that, uh, the, the polling numbers went way back up. Uh, and it shows that um, um, goodwill, demonstrated practical goodwill on the United States' part, really makes a big impact uh, in, in public opinion in these countries. So certainly uh, the U.S. Uh, help for uh, NGOs um, is, 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 would be uh, a necessary part of the mix in our diplomacy. But it's also important that we get the word out because the U.S. does a lot of this kind of thing and gets no credit for it. In fact, after the uh, Israeli war on Lebanon in 2006, uh, Hezbollah got a lot of credit for rebuilding. But what it would do, it, it, it's just brilliant. The, the Lebanese government would get, would get money from various sources. Uh, Arab states and also the European Union, and it would, would make it available to individuals who had been badly affected by the war. And they would get a lump sum payment. Hezbollah said, well, look, you give us your lump sum payments. We'll amalgamate them, and we'll get synergies out of it, and then we'll get you a really nice a new apartment building uh, that you couldn't get by yourself. Market power. Market power. Yeah. <laughs> so Hezbollah actually got to take credit for money coming in from all these other sources uh, given out to these individuals. So the United States government can't just give out money and, and sit back. You know, you have, you have to be able to get the word out to people about what you're really doing for them. I don't think we've been at all good at this. Uh, the, and again, it goes back to this emphasis on, on uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, so forth rather than, than on, on can, substance. Can I ask you one interesting piece of the Middle East puzzle? The Qataris that not only host Al Jazeera but host American air bases are uh, among those that have provided sort of open accounts to Hezbollah. Like you, you can go out and get your market power and buy your, buy your individuals here, just, just file it in this bank and, and you could do this. And, and they're also funding Hamas. They're also our friends allegedly and our allies and they've been trying to play a, a sort of odd peacemaker role in the region. They seem to be paying off and involved with every aspect of the region. Uh, they even had an Israeli trade office uh, in Qatar until recently. How do they pull that off? I mean, why, when you've got, why aren't the neoconservatives up in arms about the payments to Hezbollah and Hamas? Is it, is it because of the trade office in Qatar? How, what, I'd be interested in how you see the Qatari role. Mm. Well, I mean, the first thing to remember about Qatar is that it's one of a number of these uh, Gulf cooperation states that are very, very small. Uh, the Qatari native population is variously estimated. Uh, I think it was alleged to me last May when I was there that they had 250,000 people. I would say that's probably an upper limit. Uh, and uh, then, then uh, there are a million people there, but the rest are guest workers. They're Nepalese and Sri Lankans, and then they're given two-year visas so they can be cycled back out really easily. So you're really dealing with, with a couple hundred thousand people when you say Qatar. Uh, I mean, it is um, a, a suburb of Washington, D.C., would, would be bigger. Uh, and um, then they have 15 percent of the world's proven natural gas reserves. So it's, it's kind of a, a nation state equivalent to uh, a, a huge multi-billionaire like Bill Gates or something, right? It just has disproportionately weight. And um, the, the, the current emir uh, in Qatar, I think, is just a fascinating man because uh, he likes to rock the boat. His father was very conservative. And uh, I was in Qatar in 1988 under the old regime, and it was just this very sleepy, repressed Wahhabi society. And the current emir has opened things up, uh, and it's not Dubai, but it, it really is going great guns. Uh, and and he's also interested in having an impact on Arab culture. 
So Al Jazeera is his baby uh, in, in so many ways. And, and what he, he gave them a, a brief just to anger everybody and, and to have all kinds of points of view on it. So, so they bring on Israelis to discuss things. And nobody in the Arab world puts, puts Israelis on screen. Uh, and, uh, but then they'll also bring dissidents. And the Egyptian government is very angry at them right now. And, and then they've played a diplomatic role. And as Saudi Arabia has become more of a major power in the region and, and Egypt's uh, authority has slipped and so forth, Saudi Arabia is becoming more of a status quo kind of uh, state and it can't play the honest broker as easily. So last May when you had, um, in May of 2008, when you had a uh, conflict between Hezbollah on the one hand and uh, the Sunni uh, Arabs in, in, in Lebanon on the other uh, in West Beirut, um, the Saudis were so, so strongly identified with the Sunni faction and, uh, and, and as critics of Hezbollah that they couldn't play the kind of mediating role that they had played in 1989 in, in, in ending the Lebanese Civil War. So who came in? Well, it was Qatar, and they settled it. Uh, so I, I don't have information that they have open accounts for Hamas or Hezbollah, but I know they do give money to the Lebanese uh, um, Shiites and, and Lebanese generally who were affected by the 2006 war and that they do help with Gaza reconstruction and West Bank um, uh, development aid. Um, and I, I think it's just uh, uh, th that they are a very small place with a lot of wealth and this is the way that they make their impact on the region. Uh, Nick Berry, Foreign Policy Forum. It's been reported, incredible reports, that the Bush administration, pressed by the Pentagon, uh, has informed Israel that it would not uh, permit overflights for an Israeli attack on Iran. How do you think that's going to play out with the new government in, in Israel? And is, is it dependent on uh, Iran, Iran's enrichment uh, capability, or it is it dependent on Obama carrying out the Bush policy? Well, I think there's a, a relatively severe uh, difference of opinion between uh, the Israeli political elite and, and that in Washington, which goes across uh, administrations, because the Bush administration apparently also last May told the Israelis, no, you can't attack Iran. Uh, uh, there's a difference uh, in approach here, and it comes from the United States now being a great power in the Middle East uh, and having its own interests. So if there were an Israeli attack on uh, Iran, don't you think that the Shiites of southern Iraq might take revenge on American troops? So we would see a, a, a flare up. It would make the withdrawal maybe impossible and stick us in a quagmire again in Iraq. And then it should not be forgotten that 22 percent probably of Afghans, and these social statistics are are soft, but um, I I indicated by the parliamentary elections in Afghanistan, 22 percent of Afghans are Shiites. And the leading party amongst them uh, until 2001 was the hezbi Vahdat or Unity Party, which was very Khomeinist and loyal to Tehran. So again, the and then Iran has a lot of clients among the Persian-speaking uh, Tajiks of Afghanistan. The possibility for Iranian mischief-making in Afghanistan is enormous. Uh, so here are the two big projects the United States has in the Middle, uh, Middle East, is Iraq and Afghanistan, and Iran is central to, to them going well. So you don't want a wild card like the Israelis attacking uh, this nuclear facility. And, you know, I think Washington maybe calmed down a little bit about the Iranian nuclear program once the National Intelligence Estimate of late 2007 came out, which assessed there haven't been any weapons-related experiments since 2003. There is no weapons program, uh, and the Iranians are not even able to apparently uh, enrich to more than about 3.8 percent, which isn't even enough to get fuel for a reactor. So there's not an immediate crisis here from Washington's point of view, I think. Whereas the Israelis, I, I mean, I was in Israel last uh, uh, June, and, and I, I found you know, very intelligent, educated academics were just hysterical about Iran and the threat that it posed, and I think unrealistically so. So I, th I think Washington is just going to insist uh, uh, on, on pursuing its own path with Iran and having the Israelis sit this one out, and it is going to cause tensions. I want to go to Dimitri here for just a quick moment, make it brief, but um, I want to just on that one point ask a question. Do you think that Israel's focus and obsession on Iran is tactical? 
so that if it's shown to be conceding to the United States on this, it is, it is, it is at the bit trying that, in fact, it makes it hard to push Israel on other issues? Well, uh, it's possible. It's also possible that the Israelis will use this as a bargaining chip. That's what I mean. Yeah, right, that they'll say, look, our, we are existentially threatened by Iran. You're not letting us do anything about that. At the very least, don't make us also existentially threatened by Hamas. And, and uh, so then they'll try to use that as a bargaining chip to get their way on the Palestine issue. Dmitry. Uh, my name is Dmitry Novik. I have two questions for you, but maybe time is Why very restricted. I will start from first question. You mentioned about gender apartheid. Please speak more broadly about this phenomenon, because it's the last slavery in this civilization. It's slavery inside the Ask same the question, nation. Dimitri. Ask the question you're making. Points. My question is this. How important it, it is, because you are academic in uh, Muslim world, is it solution for this or no? Okay. So the question is about uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, but some other Muslim countries as well. Uh, gender segregation, uh, what's been called uh, gender apartheid by some observers. The first thing to say is that um, th th there, there are human rights issues in the Muslim world that need to be addressed. And the question for me is, how are they best addressed? Uh, and I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm from an Enlightenment tradition. I, want to see equal rights for everybody uh, across genders and, and, and races and religions and so forth. And um, I'm distressed uh, by systems that uh, hi uh, have hierarchies of that sort. I'm also aware that my own society has hierarchies without necessarily admitting it, uh, which also need to be fought. Uh, but, you know, the idea that the United States can, can liberate uh, Muslim women by force of arms, which has been openly and frankly adumbrated by U.S. military uh, officers and so forth is bizarre. First of all, I grew up on army bases, and I want to tell you that the I love the U.S. military, but it is not liberated with regard to views of women. Uh, and uh, the idea that they're going to liberate women is, is a little bit unlikely. Were you but, surprised by the appointment of a, of a woman to the Saudi cabinet? Yes. I mean, this is a sign of change, uh, that a woman was uh, appointed to, a, to the Saudi cabinet. And the other thing to say is, the way that gender apartheid works is, is not slavery. Uh, I object to it, but Why? it is not slavery. Because, for instance, Saudi women can go to law school and medical school. And when they go to medical school, they can work as physicians, and then they treat women. And, uh, and, and a lot of uh, Arab women wouldn't want to be seen, for certain purposes especially, by, by a man. So uh, you can have a professional woman, a woman who has a very good income and a very high status in her society who just is functioning in a, in a female sphere of, of society. And um, it, it, the, the problem is it is not, ex it's a kind of separate but equal, right? Uh, but it's not exactly equal because obviously there are going to be more, there are going to be more medical schools, more law schools, more professional uh, opportunities for men than, than women. Uh, and, and so. Uh, th there will be fewer women being able to go to medical school in Saudi Arabia than would like to. And they might do it abroad uh, and, and, and come back. But then, you know, th there are res restrictions on their role in public and so forth. But, you know, the United States invaded Iraq and uh, with this civilizational mission. Uh, and what happened? Because they were weak in Iraq, the U.S. hooked up with the Shiite fundamentalist parties who under U.S. auspices came to power, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq. Does that sound like women's liberation to you? And, and they made, uh, I mean, the women were basically put back under, the, uh, under, under all kinds of patriarchal restrictions by this fundamentalist government that we brought to power. So the idea that the U.S. can forcefully intervene in these societies and accomplish those kinds of social goals hasn't been demonstrated. Thank you, Bill. No, sorry, Bill. Yes, hi, uh, <coughs> Bill Pope, retired Foreign Service officer. I want to ask you about the recent flap about Chaz Freeman. In your conversations subsequent to that, have you found 
the reaction in the Arab and the larger Muslim world to be, you know, ho-hum, business as usual, we're not surprised, or one of more disappointment and, and wow, we thought we were going in a different direction and this is going to make it harder for Obama? Right. So the issue is that uh, Chaz Freeman, former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia, former translator uh, uh, of Chinese for uh, uh, President Nixon, uh, was uh, um, to be appointed as the chairman of the National Intelligence Council, which uh, writes the National Intelligence Estimates. Um, and uh, his uh, um, appointment was torpedoed uh, by um, neoconservatives uh, and, um, and then elements of the uh, Israel lobbies. Uh, I would argue that the decisive uh, torpedoing came when uh, prominent members of the Congress, uh, uh, Senator Schumer of New York and others, took this cause up from the Democratic side of the aisle. Uh, and it made it, I think, impossible for the Obama administration to go forward with that appointment. Um, I, I, I mean, certainly it was reported in the Arab press that uh, uh, this appointment was torpedoed by the Israel lobby and no, no, no surprises there. But it wasn't a big item. Uh, I think, you know, inside the Beltway, chairman of the National Intelligence Council is a big deal and people paid a lot of attention to this issue. But I, I don't think in the Middle East there was a, 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 a wide popular understanding of what was going on in the press or anything. And I suppose that in the, the Arab diplomatic circuit, there would have been great dismay and, and, and so forth. But that wasn't a, a, a sphere that I was privy to. I've got a lot more to see on that, but I'll do it offline. Uh, yes, right here. Thank you. <clears throat> Fatemi for Oxford Chart Group. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for being here. Uh, but just a kind of a broad general question. Uh, with the uh, ignorance and misperceptions so profound about the Islamic world, besides your book, how do you uh, plan to change it? Uh, what, what are your uh, practical suggestions about that? Thank you. Right. Yeah, is there a 10-point plan? Uh. <laughs> is there a brief? We'll get them to buy the book. Yes, But the 10-point... Yes. yes, well, you, obviously nothing further could be accomplished unless you, all of you... <laughs> including the television audience, does buy the book. Um, so um, uh, after that, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm in the information business. I, I'm a professor. I teach and I write. Uh, and uh, people often come to me and say, well, why don't you organize something? And uh, I'm 56. So if I were good at organizing things, don't you think you would have found that out by now? Uh, uh, so um, I organize. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we have other people who are very good at organizing. So what we need is a coalition of the writers and the thinkers. Uh, and not, not to say that the uh, organizers aren't also writers and thinkers, but we need a coalition of people uh, to get this word out. And um, I, I mean, I, it really is quite dismaying, the degree of misinformation that's out there and, and, and the people who put it out there. Uh, Time Warner, uh, who owns CNN, is paying Glenn Beck to spread misinformation about uh, American Muslims uh, and the Muslim world in general. Why are they doing that? Uh, why are advertisers supporting bigoted statements? Uh, I mean, I could understand why Rupert Murdoch does it over at Fox Cable News, but why, why is it going on on CNN? Uh, and uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think we do need more good information, but we also uh, need to um, understand that most Americans get their images of places like the Muslim world from television. Uh, they, they don't, I mean, I wish they read more books, but they don't. And uh, uh, it's been shown that uh, nowadays, uh, once people get out of college, they often don't, don't go back to books. So uh, we need to, uh, to take on the, the media, and we also need to put pressure on our politicians. Uh, it's, uh, many of the things that the Republican, uh, de uh, especially the Republican uh, candidates said during the presidential campaign, I mean, Tan Tancredo was talking about nuking Mecca. I mean, is that a responsible way to talk? Uh, I, I mean, this should just be unacceptable. You know, the other day I was in a, in a meeting. We'll, we'll get to you guys, I, I promise, and up here as well, and over here to Gary. But uh, the other day I was in a meeting, and I'll, I'll publicly disclose this, with, with Charles Krauthammer, Richard Pearl, and James Woolsey. And, uh, and, and it was one of these odd bedfellow meetings where 
we all basically agree for various reasons that we need a much higher price of gas, that I believe in a gas tax, and if you get, if you get gas up to $4 a barrel or, or, or a, a gallon, you can uh, uh, envision a lot of other kinds of innovation in the energy. I, I want to sort of save the planet and, you know, get, you know, renewables. They're worried about Wahhabist dependence, and so I plan to send them the chapter about the Wahhabi myth. But uh, let me go to this gentleman who's been very – what I'm going to do is cluster a few, if you don't mind, because I want to get everyone here. Bob Shadler and, and uh, uh, Gary. Hi, I'm Wendell Ballou, and I, I represent an, an Association of Islamic Charities. Um, and I want to follow on this issue of, of um, ignorance, because I think that unless the public and policymakers are aware of, of facts, and sometimes we can't agree on facts, but you can, you know, there's data that you can look at. And you and, represent Islamic Charities? Yes, I do. Friend of Charities Association. It's an association. Stuart of Levy spend much time with you. Well, I was going <laughs> to. Uh, in fact, Stuart Levy won't meet with our members. Uh. He's refused, and, and uh, uh, the organization was formed, among other things, to engage in dialogue with Levy and other policymakers. And we're distressed to learn today that his appointment as Under Secretary of Treasury is being made permanent. Uh, Levy is one of those inside government who endorses this kind of narrative that I think is – For those who don't know, Stuart Levy is an Assistant Secretary of Treasury. Under Secretary, under, under Secretary of Treasury. For intelligence for, for and terrorism. Yeah, basically right. watches bank accounts of the terrorist right. crowd, right. Uh, and a lot of – and is the author of policies that not only my guys, but uh, American um, and international nonprofit organizations uh, feel uh, have created counterproductive policies. Uh, that they're, um, but what I, I want, I would like you to comment. I got drawn off the, yeah. the trail there, but comment fault, on but comment on this this uh, counter narrative about the simplified version, simple, neat, and wrong version of Islam, of the uh, imposing the caliphate, of of Great. Sharia, all that stuff. Thanks. Right here, like go to Gary Mitchell, then in the very back. Oh, well, there's now a very back and a very back, but Gary. Um, don't mind if we cluster these, so. One, um, quickly, uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report, and I, um, as I said to you outside, um, my congratulations on the book and getting Nick Kristoff to write about it. Um, I, um, Steve talked about Madeleine Albright saying we need uh, most Islam 101, and I guess, and then, and then your book about engaging the Muslim world. My question to you is whether or not we may be dealing with something of a contradiction here, and that is, on the one hand, one of the things we, would, we learn in, in Islam 101 uh, and studying the Muslim world is to that, that if we view it as a universe, as a unit, uh, as monolithically, that's our first mistake. That segmentation within Islam and in the Muslim world is, is, is a central feature. So my question is, if that's true, uh, then is the notion of engaging um, the Muslim world uh, l l kind of a, a contradiction in terms? Okay, thank you. Um, and midway down, we'll Bob, Rob, let's just do these three here and then we'll finish. Rob Shadler? And if we can make them very brief, I would be yeah. grateful. Extra cookies? Bob Shadler, American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, with regard to Iran and the bomb, you seem to suggest two different arguments. One, that they don't want it, that they won't get it imminently. If the Islamic leadership of Iran thinks it's un-Islamic to have nuclear weapons, we need, and, and you believe that, and we should believe that, then it's one thing. It's another thing if they're trying, but they have obstacles that are going to be a couple years away. Okay, and then this gentleman with the scarf. Paul Kovic with Martin with the Peace Action. We do organize. Um, thanks, Juan, for your work, and Steve, for a good meeting. Uh, Obama administration announced 17,000 more troops in Afghanistan. They're supposed to release their multi-agency uh, uh, multi, uh, report soon. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on this issue? If you get that report Steve, before I'd I do, send it to me. And then the Steve, last. I'd, I'd, oh. I'd better do these otherwise. Okay, great. Um, with regard to uh, Muslim intolerance and the caliphate and so forth like that, Al-Qaeda is a fringe cult uh, that does foreground the uh, uh, caliphate. Uh, there are a few others like Hizb tahrir that are very uh, interested in this issue. But they're very tiny and not mainstream. And 
You don't find people in Cairo or Damascus talking about a need for a caliphate. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's another example of how uh, the, the U.S. perception of uh, Islam is distorted by uh, its, uh, the particular uh, experiences that it's had with particular groups. So Saudi Arabia is a country of 22 million citizens. The Wahhabi practices of Saudi Arabia, where women are not allowed to drive and so forth, are, are taken as somehow exemplary of Islam. There are nearly 50 Muslim-majority countries in the world. Women can drive in all of them. And in most of them, I wouldn't advise you to try to mess with the women. Uh, 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 they're very strong women, you know, and, and so forth. So the, the idea that, uh, that the Saudi f practices are exemplary of Islam is just, is just silly. But it, it so happens that the United States has had a lot to do with Saudi Arabia, and therefore it seems like that's uh, the, uh, the idea of Islam that they get. Or it was attacked by al-Qaeda, so then we think, well, you know, what al-Qaeda wants is typical of what Muslims want. And it is simply not true. It would be as though, you know, Timothy McVeigh had decided to hit China instead of Oklahoma. And, and then afterwards, uh, the Chinese believe that American white people, you know, are all like Timothy McVeigh. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, th that's a problem that we have. With regard to engaging in the Muslim world, obviously it's a very di diverse world. However, the foreign ministers of the uh, um, Muslim-majority countries do meet regularly in the organization of the Islamic Conference, and they pass resolutions, and they have concerns. So that's really the level at which you can engage the whole Muslim world. And, I, and unfortunately, people don't pay attention to the uh, uh, OIC uh, or its resolutions in the West. The press doesn't cover it. But it's very important. And uh, um, uh, so th that's what I, uh, th that sort of thing is what I mean by engaging uh, the whole Muslim world. Um, Iran is not going to have a bomb in two years. Uh, I mean, even if they wanted one, they can't do it. it, it all of the evidence is, is, uh, is there that, uh, uh, that their program is rudimentary. Uh, I can't understand this hysteria about Iranian uh, bombs, given what we know. Uh, but here's the thing. In strategy, you don't just depend on what someone says if they're your opponent or, 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 or what, they, what you think their intentions are. You pay attention to their capabilities. So the problem is that they're, they're using centrifuges to, to enrich uranium. They say for, for reactors. And as far as all of our intelligence can tell, that's right. Uh, that is, there's no weapons program. Uh, but centrifuges are potentially dual use. So 10 years out, they can enrich for uh, reactors. What if they decide to feed the stuff back through and, and re-enrich it and, and build up to the point where you could get fissile material? So that's the concern. It's, it's, it's not that we think that they're making a bomb now, but what if they decide to in the future? Uh, so um, uh, what I would say is, if they're doing this nuclear program for their security interests, so let's, not, let's stop devoting $70 million a year to overthrowing them uh, and sort of go to the United Nations Council and give them security guarantees, and maybe, maybe that would be a good bargaining chip. If they're doing it for energy, well, they'd be much better off closing the thing down and letting us go in and develop their natural gas for them, in which they'd get rich and we'd be better off because it burns more cleanly. Uh, with regard to Afghanistan, uh, this initial tranche of 17,000 troops is to help with the elections in August. If the elections aren't free and fair, if they don't go well, uh, then um, nothing is going to be able to be accomplished politically. So I, I don't think that this is a marker for an expansion of the war, uh, per se. Uh, but, and I think we should let, let Obama do his policy review. Uh, what's leaked to the press is he's asking questions like, what is the end game here? What is the objective? Those are all the questions we want him to ask, right? So I don't think you can read off from the 17,000 troops immediately that this is a um, Lyndon Johnson-style expansion of the war. I think we also should be very concerned that it not become so. Great, thank you. Let me just take the very last question here Real and then quickly, we'll wrap up because I want all of you to get your Juan Cole signed book. You haven't yes, mentioned sir. Pakistan. Would you comment on the instability and the news that's coming out that the Taliban eventually want to take it over? Right. So uh, two things to say here. When uh, there was all that trouble in the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia after the fall of the Cold War and they, they had the Velvet Revolution, nobody worried about instability. When there was all that trouble in the Ukraine, and they called it the Orange Revolution, nobody coded it as instability. 
In the past two years, the Pakistani public has thrown off a military dictatorship, instituted civilian rule, and had street politics and party politics over the issue of reinstating uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, that had been dismissed by the military dictatorship. I think that's good. This is a wonderful development. This is an outbreak of democracy in a Muslim country. Why think of it as instability? Think of it as progress. I mean, you didn't have any instability in the first years of the Musharraf uh, dictatorship because anybody who protested was beaten. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, actually the police refused to beat people in this case uh, and, and, and let the processions proceed. So I don't see that as instability. Uh, as for the Taliban, uh, the Pakistani Taliban taking over the, the country, this is unrealistic fear. The pa Pakistani pa Taliban are operating in the federally administrated tribal areas, uh, which are three and a half million people. Uh, the, the Pakistani population is 165 million. Uh, the, the size of those areas is that of New Hampshire. Pakistan is the size of California, Oregon, and Washington put together. So they're not. They're not going to, Pakistan has a very professional military. They're not going to take over the country. But uh, they can cause a lot of trouble. They can blow up checkpoints. They can blow up hotels. I mean, they blew, blew up something uh, yesterday. Uh, and so they're an element of instability. Uh, but that's not my fear that, that the Taliban are going to take over Pakistan. If you know Pakistanis, they're not, they're, they're not actually, believe it or not, most Pakistanis are not fundamentalists. They're, they're either religious traditionalists or they're modern secularists or something in between. But uh, they're actively afraid. The majority of the Pakistani population actively afraid of Talibanization, and this comes out in all the polls. We all have a long journey to take to learn more about the Muslim world, but that happens to be, Alan, Chapter 5, Pakistan and Afghanistan Beyond the Taliban. So I will reference uh, that to uh, encourage you to read it and, and all of those on C-SPAN and watching on the blog. I want to thank Juan Cole so much. Uh, for sharing some time with us and his views on the region. You're welcome back anytime. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, why don't we uh, we'll bring this, we'll give him a round of applause, and then uh, let's go buy some books. Okay. Thanks so much.